Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 65th episode of the RIT Podcast. And we're heading out to British Columbia because there's been a lot going on with the BC NDP leadership race. It started out as what seemed like a coronation for David Eby. Then he had an opponent and now that opponent has been disqualified. So to break it all down, I'm joined by Global BC's politics reporter, Richard Zussman. Richard, uh, it's been a, a bit of a week in uh, BC. This is like a classic BC moment here, Eric. We've had this political... Uh, tumult for a week now and then as we're recording this we're in the middle of an earthquake drill at the legislature so there's a whole lot going on it has been a fascinating week you know starting back a few days ago when uh, we got a leaked copy of a report being presented to the bc ndp executive recommending that angelia pitterai be disqualified from the race she was the only person running against david eby and then the next day the province's executive, the BC NDP executive, voted to disqualify her based on that recommendation. And now we know David Eby will be the next premier of British Columbia. So when he got into the race uh, at the beginning, he had a lot of the caucus behind him. Was the party just expecting that this was going to be an unopposed coronation? That was part of the expectation, Eric, was that we spoke last around the time that a lot of this was shaking down and Premier Horgan had announced he was leaving and... Uh, some big heavyweights decided uh, not to run. Uh, and that led to David Eby becoming the perceived frontrunner. And then quickly, uh, climate activist Angelia Pitarai, with the backing of a number of federal NDP MPs, as well as Avi Lewis, who is a former NDP uh, candidate federally, uh, launched this bid uh, to get her as the activist candidate in the NDP race, speaking to the grassroots. And they were tremendously successful signing up members. Uh, we never got any official numbers, but some uh, reports had it that she outsold David Eby two or even three to one. But the problem is, as deemed by the party, those memberships were largely illegal. Using a third party database, in this case, Dogwood BC, to contact members, using resources from Dogwood to call members using resources from Dogwood to buy ads. There was even a YouTube video where one of uh, Epitari's supporters said that she would buy memberships for those that didn't have money. All of that was investigated, and ultimately the CEO of the race decided to disqualify Epitari on those grounds. So it was a lot more complicated, to get back to your question, than EB had expected. And part of it as well, as you know in these leaderships, it's all about getting out and selling memberships. EB and his caucus supporters, you mentioned it, he had, in essence, the entire caucus. They didn't get out there and sell membership. They thought they took this for granted. And it, it required the party to step in to ensure that he ended up as the leader. How, how did that happen? How did it happen that someone who's a front runner uh, just doesn't really seem prepared to mount an actual campaign? Yeah, and they were ready to talk policy. It's just they seemed unwilling at times. And part of it is, in this province, the BC NDP does not have a lot of experience with government and leadership at the same time, right? They've been in power now for five years. John Horgan has been comfortable in that position. They ran a lot of leadership before that, but that's when they were in opposition. And the MLAs had a lot more time to go out into community, to engage. This government has been focused, as they describe it, on government. And the previous executive at the party let the membership numbers dwindle. And then on top of that, uh, the, the MLAs that were supporting EB uh, were not out there in community getting membership. And part of that uh, is a failing of EB's campaign. Uh, part of that is a failing of the party itself in terms of letting the numbers dwindle. So it's really interesting. Like, how does that happen? I think they're all trying to ask themselves that same question, Eric. It's, how did we let this happen? Because clearly it tarnishes David Eby coming into office. Um, on Thursday morning, uh, following the decision, what happened was David Eby beamed into caucus by video. He's not even here in Victoria. He was in Vancouver and received multiple standing ovations for doing that. But they didn't even inform the media that he was doing that. It, it is just a complete sort of um, disconnection from the reality of, of what's unfolding here as the party tries to, to heal from the internal wounds, it's no doubt feeling. So for uh, Epitari, uh, was this 
someone from the outside coming and taking over? Was it a grassroots that existed in the base? Because as you mentioned, the the number of membership within the BCNDP had dwindled to an amount where it could get taken over from yeah. the outside. So is this is this something that is from the outside or is it just a group of people who would normally be NDP members and just got engaged in this particular race? See, that, that's the thing I'm, I'm wondering here is how much of a takeover is it or what, an attempted one? What's so interesting here is the dynamic between the federal party and the provincial party. And largely they have been in alignment for a long time. You know, we've seen John Horgan campaign on behalf of Jagmeet Singh. We've seen Jagmeet Singh campaign on behalf of John Horgan. They are friendly. They are friends. But there is a difference. The NDP federally still has that activist feel about it. And many of their members carry that with them. There is a sense of opposition that exists within them, whereas the BC NDP is now in a position to govern. And to win elections in BC, you need to convince federal liberals to vote for you. The BC liberals get the conservative vote. The BC NDP get the NDP vote, and the elections are won with federal liberals. And this government has moved to the middle. And this part of the party is firmly from, in part, the federal wing, but also that activist wing. And, and a lot of it's built on environmental policies, but there's more than that. There were very aggressive health care policies. There were aggressive policies um, around the opioid crisis and... The, the leaders of this movement were from climate activist organizations, Dogwood, 350.org, but also federal candidates. So Abby Lewis was one. Anjali Abhutarai was a federal candidate who almost beat uh, Talib Noam Mohammed in Vancouver Granville in the last federal election. They are from the party, but they are not from the BC NDP. And that distinction has been made by those within the party. In terms of the members they've signed up, they were the ones that want this government to be more aggressive around climate policy. There's frustration around the Site C Dam, around LNG, around Trans Mountain. Uh, there is frustration around labor strife, around homeless encampments. And the activist wing wants to see government move quickly on these issues where governing is much more difficult than that. And so those are where the divides exist, and that's where her organizers come from. It's, it's really the ground zero for some of these divides we see between provincial and federal NDP because uh, you have that in Alberta, you have it in Saskatchewan where, you know, in Saskatchewan, they recently disinvited Jagmeet Singh to actually attend their convention. But the difference is that the federal NDP has a lot of seats in, in British Columbia and needs to continue to have a presence in British Columbia. So uh, is this going to be a lasting sort of uh, gash, a uh, uh, wound between the federal and provincial wings of the party in British Columbia? It was really interesting that we only saw one MP, Benita Zarillo, come out in favor of Angelia Pitarai to allow her to run uh, before she got disqualified. None of the others came out, and that includes Jenny Kwan, who's a former MLA herself, Don Davies, Peter Julian, institutions politically in this province who rely heavily on their relationship with the provincial party. Jagmeet Singh's another one, right? We didn't hear from any of them about this provincial race, largely due to the importance of that relationship. But there will be divides. You know, Abby Lewis has done this before. Uh, he was one of the leaders in the charge to take down Tom Mulcair at the federal level. Uh, the, the work here is to get climate activism on the agenda, and they saw uh, these campaigners are very good and very effective at reaching out to their base and uh, impacting change. And they saw a membership base that had dwindled, and they did far better than anyone would have expected. So there will be room. This part of the party will be looking for a home. And they're vowing to fight this the best they can. Is it disrupting nomination battles within the BC NDP, potentially trying to unseat current MLAs to get their candidates, forcing the leader to make a decision? Do they take their policies towards the BC Greens? and try to unseat NDP um, MLAs that way. There are going to be strategies here from this group uh, to try to impact the change that they want to see. So, yeah, that leads me to my next question. Is, is Do we know exactly what Petra is going to do next now that she has been disqualified? Yeah, it's about the grassroots, she's always said. So there will be a process here where they look at appeals, they look at potentially using the court. 
but largely it is about using the membership base to their advantage. So those two things that I mentioned, trying to disrupt nomination battles or potentially getting involved in another political party. Um, those would be the ways that a Twitter I use is this platform. You know, she wants the ideas she puts forward to be debated, to be discussed. She's been adamant on that every time I've spoken to her, that these are policies she, she wants to see, and she's trying to figure out the most effective way to have those policies front and center for debate. Is there something that the BC New Democrats can do now that it'll be David Eby uh, who will become the leader and the premier, presumably uh, a lot sooner than expected, um, to keep those people within the party? Or has this, is this kind of irrevocable that, uh, that you know, this, this divide is going to kind of taint his premiership and his leadership of the party going forward? What I can't figure out, Eric, is whether they even want these people to be a part of the party. And these are members that they are accusing signed up illegally. They shouldn't have been members to begin with. They are green members or they are activists who don't want to be part of a political party, what that means. So they want their vote, but I'm not sure they want them as part of their party. And that's going to be one of the challenges for David E.B. Does he open himself up to this group and say, I need you here, while also trying to remain in the center on crucial issues around affordability, around the health care crisis, around public safety, where uh, they need to govern in a position that will be in some ways counter to what many of these members would like to see. So I'm not convinced there's going to be a big play to keep these members, but they need those votes. So that's going to be the fine balancing act. You mentioned moving things up. Uh, Global was scheduled to host the debate between Anjali Apitarai and David Eby on November 5th. There's a really nice ballroom booked in Vancouver area for that day. It seems like that could be a perfect day to host an event where you announce your new leader. And then that following week just happens to be a break week here, which is also a really good time potentially to go over and visit the Lieutenant Governor at Government House and have a premier sworn in. So I would be looking at potentially November 8th or 9th as the day David Eby becomes the premier. I don't know that for sure, it's speculation. But I think that that's based on reading some of the tea leaves, I think. And that's a, a full month earlier than uh, expected. And it will allow him to have some ability to work on next year's budget, which will come out in February, and start the process of governing, uh, which is, you know, as we expected, he's going to be able to do. Now we'll have a little bit more ability to, to do that a bit sooner. Does he now need, though, a little bit more time to uh, put this story behind him and the NDP? Because, you know, a new premier, popular party leading in the polls, maybe you want to go to the, uh, to the voters early. Now it seems like he might have a little bit of bridges to mend or at least to give the impression of, no, no, we can handle things, we can govern. Uh, this whole leadership you know, kerfuffle is not reflection of our ability to you know, keep things together. I have a decent track record, Eric, on my predictions around when elections are going to happen, uh, but <laughs> you never know. I, my best sense now is we are not going to go er very early. I, I would look at that window of potentially the next six to is fall of 2024. I would look if early it would be spring of 2024, maybe one of those, you know, budget 2024, use that as your platform, forge forward. What's so weird about this is David Eby only released one platform piece. He hasn't put out any real ideas about what he's going to do as premier. And now they're going to be facing, as you mentioned, questions and criticism about just becoming the premier, that I'm not sure where the window is to outline those ideas that would have been outlined. They have policy pieces ready on the environment, on public safety, on health care. Where do those go? We don't know. And that's one of the very weird things about how all of this is shaken down is it puts extra pressure on ED to sell a vision but once he's premier it's very hard to be treating it like an election campaign so there's going to be some challenges there defining what he stands for and ensuring the British Columbians know that so that's my guess is he's going to need more time in office to do that work and then go to the electorate with that. But he's, he's also following in the footsteps of B.C. Uh, premiers and leaders in having some controversy involved with either their coming to power or leaving power, uh, which I guess is something that's normal for B.C. politics by now. Yeah. The John Horgan era seemed to be the, the calmest one, and, and now there's this. 
I'm worried I told this story already on your podcast, but I will tell it again anyways because it's one of my favorites. In the halls of the legislature, there are portraits of all the premiers. And when you go back after the Bennett administration, so W.A.C. Bennett, longest-serving premier, Dave Barrett for one term, Bill Bennett back in for the Socred, second longest-serving premier. Then you get to the situation where you have premier who's resigned in disgrace, summer job premier, premier who resigned in disgrace, premier who <laughs> resigned in disgrace, summer job premier, usual Dessange who was in for a few months, summer job premier. Uh, then you have uh, Gordon Campbell who served for a long time but eventually resigned in disgrace. Christy Clark lost a confidence vote, and John Horgan's the only one that was able to leave on his own accord. So, <laughs> yes, it is hard leaving politics. We didn't think it was that hard entering the Premier's office, but David Eby proved us all wrong, because it, it really has been a lot more um, fascinating and turbulent than I think anyone expected. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't expect that we'd be chatting again as soon as we <laughs> are. <laughs> so. yeah, nor did I. Nor did I. And it really has unfolded quickly, and, and it's left just a lot of a mess to clean up. And, and when, you know, new, when you get elected premier, you often give yourself some time, a honeymoon period. And this is not going to exist for David. It's going to be right from the go, criticism around whether this was democratic or not, the way that this unfolded. And he's going to have to convince people that this was done legitimately, convince them that the Cole report investigated fully, and then get all with the business of government. Yeah. So, uh, Richard, it's been uh, quite a week, as I said. So I really okay. appreciate you you taking a couple of minutes uh, in the midst of a earthquake uh, drill <laughs> to join us and explain it all. Yeah, thanks, Eric. My pleasure as always.